What's up guys, welcome back to the TCG Scrubs teaching week where we're gonna go over the history of Force of Will. Now we're gonna go into this history pretty in depth and so that means it's gonna be separated into probably two videos I'm assuming. Uh, this first one will be going over the Grimm and Alice cluster. In later videos we'll see how those shape up but uh, should kind of be the rest of it all the way up to New Valhalla. One of the things I'm not going to really focus on too much here in the beginning is going to be the original Valhalla set. And that's mostly because it was, for the most part, ignored. It was limited on where it was played. So, um, it existed. I mean, it nothing huge really happened within the set. And, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll do a follow-up video later if you guys really want to see something about that. As for the official history of the game, as for when it truly started with the Grim Cluster, we'll be going over that point onwards. But first, a little bit about the company itself. So something I forgot to mention in our last video was what is Force of Will? So Force of Will is a trading card game from a privately owned company of the same name, Force of Will LTD. This company today has produced two card games, Force of Will and Caster Chronicles. It could be a third one one day, but it's probably not likely as uh, Architect, which was another card game they were working on. We haven't heard anything about it, so it may have just been completely scrapped and moved on. Now, the reason why I usually find it important to say who the company is behind the game is because it's often confused on who created and produced the game to begin with. You often will hear people saying it was a Bushy Road game, it was from Konami, but it's always been Force of Will. Now, the game consists of beautiful card art that has, in my opinion, gotten even better over the years. Ranging from anywhere from an anime art style to even a fantasy style. You kind of see everything here and there. And yeah, there's some cards here and there as well that aren't so great. Now in this card game, two players will battle it out until one is left standing. Going through their decks, playing things like chants, resonators into the field. Performing special abilities with their J slash ruler to gain an advantage until taking the final blow into your opponent for game. Life totals are 4,000 each. So once you get your opponent to zero, you would then win the game. But we'll explain more into detail at a later time as to how to play the game. Uh, for now, we'll just go over the history. Uh, the game attracts all walks of life from collectors to casual players and competitive players and has a great community to follow in which you can be found on Facebook, Discord, or YouTube. We'll have some links in the description down below. Uh, you may even find some people who either cr cross into all sections of the social media, some who strictly stick to like Discord or Facebook or YouTube. Uh, quite a few people who play the game, and I'm always pointing this out. I'm not sure if people really take too much attention to it, but a lot of announcements will take place on Facebook, but there's a huge chunk of players who just do not use Facebook. So if you ever find you're trying to find some information, we do news weekly, and you can kind of catch up on everything that's been happening. All right, so now to the history of Force of Will. Now, Force of Will has only been around for a few years. It started in 2012, releasing Valhalla Cluster in Japan. Then in 2013 internationally, with Michigan being one of the only U.S. states to receive product at the time. In 2015, the rest of the U.S., Canada, and officially had access to Valhalla. The world didn't see an official release of the game until 2015, when the game was released internationally, but with small changes. An example of some of the small changes are just things like Life Break were removed and some of the rules were, were adjusted. The, the game ended up very well structured once coming to the Grim Cluster. Now, when releasing the Grim Cluster, if you looked at the release dates from the previous video on set releases, you'll notice the first two sets of the Grim Cluster were back to back, or actually the same day kind of release. And that was only because Japan was already ahead of schedule. They had already received these two earlier in the year, and the US and the rest of the world were just going to play catch up to this. So we received the first two sets immediately, and then rolled into the kind of like every three month release from this point going forward. Now anything before the official 2015 release of the game is ignored and given the sparse distribution, especially for cards available in English, the original Valhalla is not considered legal for play, except for some alternative formats such as Origin or other fun formats created by community like Epic Stories. Um, we'll talk about some of those maybe at a later time. As a result of the scarcity of English Valhalla cards, they are hard to come by so the prices are really expensive on some of these cards. Probably more so than they should be, and uh, the, the more expensive cards are obviously going to be the rulers that came out back then. Over the years since release, the game has had some ups and downs, and seen players kind of come and go, but some of them still remain here from the beginning. The game's initial reception was great, catering to both anime and fantasy style artwork. Stores were carrying product, groups were forming locally, and everything was going great, and Grand Peas were firing off everywhere with great attendance. At this time, players were also introduced to a series of cards that would be utilized all the way up to the point of rotation of the Lapis Cluster. What are those cards? Those cards were called Dual Stones. Dual Stones were a special stone type that would be capable of having the option of producing one of two possible colors. 
And these cards had no real drawback or kind of repercussions to its use, besides that it was a special magic zone that can only be run at a maximum of four cards per named card. Many opinions will form later as to the necessity of these cards, as they gave many decks the ability to splash in other colors while remaining dedicated to its main. Grim Cluster would also be one of the few times that true magic stones are produced. Some of these stones would have a more broad playstyle, while others would be more general and probably seeing less play as a result. Uh, during the Grim Cluster, the competitive formats were as follows. During the initial release of uh, Crimson Moon Fairy Tale and the Two Towers, uh, primarily was Abdul. Other decks shining as well were Little Red aggro decks, Green, Grim, and Puss in Boots. Upon the release of MPR, there was a more wide open variety of play. Decks would look like Pandora Turbo, various forms of Abdul Control, various forms of Grim, kind of splashing in different colors depending on which way they want to go, as well as the original Scheherazade. This is also the time that the first Force of Will GP events would take place. Grand Prix are events held around the world, uh, which allowed players to put their decks to the test trying to win paid or unpaid trips to Japan for the World Grand Prix. Structure for top 8 prizing varies on attendance, and attendance in the first year held huge numbers, some locations said to have attendance of 300 plus players. The only thing that ended up holding the game back from further success was the release of Millennia of Ages, a set that caused many stores to turn away from carrying product afterwards, as the set contained no rulers and only 50 cards in the set, yet it had 36 10 card booster packs. In all ways, the box was advertised and sold as a standard booster box while it fell short of those standards. A normal box would contain the same number of booster packs, but would have a much larger set including rulers for an average of 110 cards. With the game doing as well as it had been already, stores picked up on the set as they had with older sets to find sales had dropped. People just didn't need this box nearly as much as they needed the other boxes. I've opened this box. I uh, received three boxes from one of our viewers. Opening one practically gave you more than enough of every card. Maybe there's a couple SRs or rares that you could have picked up off of uh, a friend during trade or from like secondary market for very cheap. It was pretty pointless. I've, I've said this before, but I felt this set should have been like right around thirty dollars. Like that's probably more an ideal price. You probably wouldn't have seen as big of a bellyache about it, but uh, it's said to have been one of the bigger sinking points back then for why the player base began to drop. The low sales of this box and the high volume of purchases that local game stores made from distributors put Force of Will in bad terms with stores. Now, Some would later argue that if stores had paid a little bit more attention to what they were purchasing, they could have made smarter purchasing decisions. In a recent interview with Alan Hicks, he did mention that when you're going to get ready to purchase from your distributor, there's a sales sheet. The sales sheet will show you what's included within the set. Had they had looked at the set and seen that there were only 50 cards, no rulers, and seen the SRR distribution, they could have purchased accordingly, but they didn't, and many stores picked up the same amount of product they had been purchasing of all the other boxes. Many after losing money on the set stopped carrying forcible product in stores and moved on to other card games. Now some stores did this anyways because a lot of stores will run as like a flavor of the month type of game store where whatever is hot at the time, they'll keep carrying that type of product and then move on to another one and another one. Uh, this is a topic that many others have different opinions on as to whether MOA was to blame for the collapse of stores versus card game sales suffering in general. A note to mention here is that the release of the set had no fluctuation of the competitive meta. While all was doom and gloom for some, others also celebrate the release of the first Vingolf set, a set contained reprints as well as unique cards to it. It was a box that had five rulers, one of each attribute, some resonator spells, special magic stones. This box was useful for many players. It helped newer players jump into the game and older players to get more useful cards with its reprints. It reprinted all dual stones, great spells like Thunder, Rapid Decay, Stunning to Death, and Law of Silence. Some of those saw some heavy competitive play. Uh, buying two boxes of this would guarantee a full play set of every card that it contained. Uh, there was no randomized packs. It was very structured. I remember when I started to gain interest in Force Will, I remember asking the online community their recommendations for a new player, and it was always to buy two of these boxes. 
These boxes contained just about everything a new player would need to get into the current meta, the most important being the dual stones. When I said the special magic stones that were printed in here, it was a reprint of the original dual stones from the first two sets. Also, with the printing of the Dual Stones in Vingolf 1, it's a keynote to the game lost a few investors at this point who assumed that the Dual Stones from the Grim Cluster would retain their value, but were sorely disappointed, which caused an overflux and massive drop in Dual Stone prices. As the cluster comes to a close, we'll get to the Alice Cluster here soon, but we approach the first World's Grand Prix that US players attend, which takes place as WGP 2015. The World Grand Prix is an event the company holds bringing all the top players from around the world together to test their skills in what's generally a cluster only format. Players are usually given the new starters and first set of the first block, in this case being the Melgus Faria dual deck and the first uh, set being Seven Kings of the Land. These cards were new and regalia were introduced and some judge calls were made during this event that would end up costing some players crucial games. Uh, some of these judge calls were incorrect judge calls I might add. Uh, one judge would end up making a miss call in a situation that would end up costing a US player Adam Reiser the championship. Adam's opponent, Italian player Ricardo, has in his field two Gawain, Percival, a Hector, Guiber, Gareth, and Bedivere, while Adam's board is just two Gawain and one Guinevere. Now life totals for Adam is 4,000, Ricardo at 3,000. The following plays take place. Adam draws his way into Flame King Shout. Place Flame King Shout. Ricardo allows this to resolve. On resolution, Adam puts into play one of two land slots in his hand. Adam then demon flames Ricardo's damaged Gwen, destroying it. Adam puts his other land slot into play. In Ricardo's field now, the Gwen has been removed but there's a Percival who should also be destroyed, but is still in the field. The judge watching over, this, over the finals game points this out to Ricardo. Ricardo then attempts to banish the Percival at this point to save the other Gwen. Adam points out that the opportunity of the play has passed as Ricardo had allowed for Demon Flame to already resolve. The judge stands firm on a calling that he can resolve the Percival. Adam accepts the judge call and goes on with the game which at the next turn really just turns the game around to Ricardo's favor, uh, causing him the game at this point. The call lost Adam his first place finish at Worlds, and to be clear, the judge later understood his mistake. He apologized to Adam. As apology for the situation, the company did provide Adam with a paid Worlds invite to the following year, as well as a promo printed, which he ended up choosing in Lancelot. In previous years, WGP winners or top two would often have promos printed of themselves. The Royal Grand Prix is generally also the kickoff of the new year with the product. The year starts off with an item that we would never really see replicated ever again, and that's going to be a dual deck. It's a deck catered to helping two players jump into the game. It contained two full-size 50 card decks, not 40, but 50. Two rulers who synergize with those decks, 10 basic stones for each player, allowing them to battle each other. What made the set unique was the introduction of Regalia, a card type that would cause grumbles among players due to the free cost to be played, powerful abilities, as well as some containing multiple powerful abilities on top of this. Laventine, for example, if you take a look at the card here. The release of this dual deck also comes with the release of the first set, the Seven Kings of the Land. Seven Kings of the Land contained 10 rulers in this set that could be pulled, the Seven Kings, two versions of Alice and the Blazer. The competitive format for when Seven Kings of the Land releases primarily becomes a Blazer slash Bahamut kind of aggro uh, format. Um, another point in time where kind of what's referred to as Baja Blast becomes kind of an issue uh, due to the Regalia release. Uh, but the decks we did see having competitive play are going to be Blazer Control, Yamata Reanimator, Resert Control, Grim Toolbox, Vlad, Baja Aggro, Bloody Harla and General Knights, as well as Machina OTK. At the time of the release of the next set, we also get five more starter decks. These containing the mentioned before Regalia, but in full play sets. At the release of the same time of these starter decks, the set being released was the Twilight Wanderer. This is kind of where TCG Scrubs start to really gain attention to the game and uh, where we start picking things up and, and kind of playing more. Uh, so. While first picking up the dual decks to start playing against each other, we didn't realize at the time there would be an issue uh, with a new ruler coming out in the set, the Twilight Wanderer, by the name of Reflect Child of Potential, Refrain Child of Convergence, 
often referred to as just Reflector Frain or RR for short. This, this card would soon become a big issue and the main reason why this local scene for us in Austin ended up drying out. Also causing other players around the world to also move on and force changes in the way that the American GP season would end up being going forward. The card Priorata allowed for a user to on either player's turn filter the top card of their main deck at the cost of gaining a counter. This counter gain wasn't even a negative as it had value on its J ruler side allowing for various abilities to be activated based on the number of counters removed. The ruler was strong. There was no question about it, draw power in a game like this definitely has huge advantage. Decks going forward based on a certain archetype that would usually use a ruler more suited for play, such as a Fairy Alice inside of a Fairy deck, would be better replaced with Reflect Refrain. This would go for more than just a few decks. There would become a point where there was not any reason to run other rulers, and GP events top 8 were dominated only by Reflect Refrain. Following is the meta at the release of Twilight Wanderer. Necrolance, Alice's World, Reflect Refrain Control, Reflect Refrain Ramp, Balatina 2.0, and Machina OTK. Something to point out about this, even though not having the name of Reflect Refrain inside of it, Necrolance and Alice's World are both Reflect Refrain decks as well. Approaching January of 2016, Reflect Refrain is errated from its front side ability being used during any turn to only being used during the controller's turn. So if I was playing Reflector Frame, I could only filter the top card of my deck during my turn only. I can no longer do it during my opponent's turn. As the season progresses, we get to a, the next set, which is the Moonlit Savior. Streams with the company representative at the time, Jordan Blanco, we were assured on multiple things about Reflect, such as possible future erratas, how the power level of the card is just assumed, and if we all run it, then of course it will always be in the top. Or how certain decks had just not been discovered yet that could possibly take Reflect down. The new set included some card that some were hopeful in working against Reflect, such as Gil, who had an ability to stop Reflect from gaining or even using its counters, but some of these methods were just too slow for competitive play. The competitive meta at this time for the Moonlit Savior would be, again, Necrolance. Alice's World, Reflect Control, Valentina 2.0, Xion Angels, Machina OTK, and Huanglong. Huanglong being still a Reflect deck. We approach the release of the Battle for Adaractia. At the release of BFA, we get a noticeable change to the cards, and that's the font. This didn't go over well with many, and I know personally I didn't like it, as it was too difficult to read. Luckily, at a certain point later, we will lose that text and go back to normal. An important note before getting into the details of this set was in the competitive GP circuit, news would come up of an early rotation, something recognized within the US GPs for the remainder of the season. Grimm would be excluded from play for the remainder of the season, this taking place at the release of Battle for Adaractia, only affected the tail end of the season, being as it took place right around June. Some things, some cards affected where dual stones were gone, cards considered to cause Reflect Refrain to be a bigger threat were gone, but Regalia were still going to become a bigger issue as a result. This Battle for Adaractia set was set to be contain an answer that would work against Reflect in the form of Kill J Ruler spell, which is Black Moonbeam. This card created to help prevent the gain of J Ruler side abilities by killing the J Ruler and becoming unchaseable was supposed to be a way to help combat Reflect. It ended up aiding the ruler more than it ended up hurting it, as they just ended up running the card themselves. Now instead of having a possibility of having other rulers shine as a result of this card coming out, it actually further suppressed those rulers from even becoming a thing. Especially since a lot of rulers released at this time, such as the ones that came out in Battle for Adaractia, 100% would only function when they came into play off of their J ruler side. The competitive metaphor battle for Adaractia at the time was going to be Necrolance, a stealth deck, Knights, Matchstick, Dark Alice, Machina OTK, and Wonglong. You're curious about which ones were Reflect Refrain, you can obviously assume things like Necrolance, Stealth, Knights, and Wonglong. Uh, Knights being a possibility of maybe being a red ruler, but I'm pretty sure it was Reflect. But here comes to close another Vingolf set, which is hyped as it was going to be based on an anime and video game series by the name of Bakuya Chronicles. 
While this is known to some, it's also unknown to others, but it was at least a known enough name at the time. Upon spoiler season, the set was honestly disappointing, with only one really good card being sniped from the blind spot, and it really didn't see any real competitive play. Uh, one of the other best cards outside of this was going to be Class G's Tank, which would later see a, a larger amount of play. On top of this, some of the art was recycled, and we were told by Jordan that the art was provided by the company behind Valkyria Chronicles, and this wasn't that great as you can see here with Elshin Flower. The set reception affected the sales of this set, which would shape up the distribution of later Vingolf sets. The best thing from Vingolf 2 would be reprinting of Dual Stones. Vingolf Dual Stones have these yellowish borders. Uh, they also had those in Vingolf 1, I just forgot to mention that. Here's an example of the Vingolf Stone prints, and here is the Vingolf 2 Stones. Noticeable change from that first set to this set would be the text that kind of came out during the release of Battle of Adaractia. These stones are kind of what gave this set its value. Now this set ended up tanking at one point to about $12 per box. The dual stones alone had a value ranging from anywhere from $15 to $20, accounting for the fact that there was two of each dual stone in a box. Overall, the year out of close was disappointing. With worlds coming up, spoilers ahead, for the next cluster, we would only hope that it would go up from here. And then there was a series of announcements that took place at this time. The first was going to be the reprint printing of dual stones, simply the same dual stones with new artwork. This occurred in May, dual stones being the cornerstone of how competitive decks are constructed, allowing players to play some tech cards in off colors if needed. This reprint would be the first set of the next cluster, Curse of the Frozen Casket. This announcement is being seen as good to some, but bad to others would get everybody's opinion split. And the reason why it was so important at this point is because if it's coming out in the next cluster, that means we had two full years with the stones. Some were already getting excited to see in a format where we'd go to a monocolor only format. The second announcement in September was that Reflect Refrain was banned. Many players were happy about this decision. I'm not sure if it was rumor or fact, but I do recall for the longest time that the company was against having a ban list. This is going to be the first time the ban list would actually form. Also tied into one of these two announcements was the news of how J slash rulers being reworked in functionality to allow for the mechanic to really shine going forward. The old way rulers worked was over the course of the game, if you were to ever perform judgment of your ruler and your ruler destroyed, you would lose all info of the ruler side of the card, except for its ruler name, race, and type. Type referring to ruler, example is girl in twilight garb. She would lose her judgment ability, her ruler's activate ability that allowed her to remove cards from graveyard. In the rework of how rulers would function going forward, upon being destroyed, a ruler retains its entire name and ruler's side abilities. So if the ruler, like I mentioned, Dark Alice, were to be destroyed, she could still continue to removing cards from game. Furthermore, a change to the layout of cards is also made, making some smart design changes that will help maximize the view of artwork of cards, which is one of the strong suits of this card game. A comparison of old art and new art is up, and we can see on the side here, attack and defense has been moved to the left side, making it easier to compare stats when attacking into another J slash resonator. On the cost wheel, the void cost of the cards was moved from the side into the center of the wheel. The attribute of a card moved from the bottom right corner and from being really large to being a smaller along the same text line as where the type of the card is. Some more changes to the way the cards would work were chance. So we used to have chance and chant instant cards and now they're all just generalized as chance. The chance that can be played at instant speed are just given the keyword ability of quick cast. The bigger of the, all these changes that were made were that rulers gained a new ability. All rulers going forward would have the keyword of energize. Energize simply meant that going second, your ruler would gain a coin. The coin could be banished to produce a specified will that was determined by the ability. For instance, if we take a couple cards here that are rulers, you'll see they have energize red, energize red black, or energize green. This would allow them to produce one of those set colors. Once the coin was banished, it's gone. You can no longer use energize. Some would argue the point of going second had the advantage to pair, as paired to going first. Some saying going first still had the advantage because at least you were still having that first stone always. Meanwhile, Energize was just a temporary will production. Now this wraps up the Alice Cluster, as well as everything that we're going to be talking about in this history video of Force of Will. I do hope all this was great information for you and helping you catch up to date. If I do miss any bit, I'll mention it at a later time. 
Uh, but a huge special thanks to some of the people who helped make this history video as accurate as possible. Uh, we worked with several people sending them this script so that we can get everything correct or if I'm missing something to get it added in. So a huge shout out to people from Jeremy Franklin of Ruler School to Stephanie Shaw, Taylor Norris, Mike Rance, and even Colin for helping me uh, go over this. Uh, and I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And we'll see you in the second video of the History of Force of Will. And uh, we'll see y'all next time.